Welcome to Gumball Love. I'm Melissa Ledger, professional relationship coach, creator of Gumball Love, and the Back to You Academy. If you're ready to stop the cycle of toxic men, get through the breakup once and for all, and finally get back to you, you are in the right place. This journey is about healing your heart, and you are encouraged to take the pace that is just right for you. In the process, you will build a foundation of confidence and strength that will make you unshakable, I promise. So get ready to level up your mindset and your lifestyle as you awaken the seeds of greatness just waiting to burst into full bloom. Let's do this. Welcome back to another episode of Gumball Love. I'm your host, Melissa Ledger. Gumball Love is about stopping the cycle of sugar high romance, discovering your worth, and finding true love. This is the order I believe we will all be able to accomplish this, but we have to stop the cycle. We have to stop making the same decisions over and over again that lead us to the same result. And this is what I would do. I would be attracted to the same guy over and over again, and I didn't understand why it was, why I was always fooled. And then I would feel dumb and only to repeat it again and then go through the same thing over and over again. So I hate when people say, don't make this mistake because I don't feel like any of those things or those decisions were mistakes. I believe we're all exactly where we are supposed to be and it's how we move forward. Like Maya Angelou says, when you know better, you do better. And so ultimately, I want to help you find the person that makes life easier, that you feel a collaboration. My love and I, I just feel like every day is, and we just talk about it all the time. We are so in love. We have so much fun together. We're always laughing. It's gross, right? You're like, Ugh, who wants to hear about a happy couple? But I want you to know, I mean, I did not settle and I really made sure that I waited for the right person. And he and I have talked a lot about how, you know, I I hate to say the guy's perspective, but I do gain a lot from hearing his perspective. So you'll get you guys will get to know him. But he spent 15 years in New York City, corporate America dating. He's a tall, good looking guy. And he had a ton of guy friends. And he watched thousands of people go on dates and tons of dynamics and worked at a huge company. And when you are dating in New York, it's there's so many, so much more going on that you get a lot of experiences in a short period of time. Or if you're there for several years, you get a lot of experiences. And we talked a lot when you should you have sex and what should that look like? And we you know when is it, when do we know? And we even talked about the stereotype of guys will think if you have sex with them right away that you do this with a lot of guys. And I said, So why can't the girl think the same thing? Like, oh, I guess if you're willing to have sex with me on the first date, then you've probably done this with a lot of girls. And we both just kind of agreed that it is a double standard. But it's like, he's like, I want to feel like Christopher Columbus. What was his other example? You know, they want to feel like they're the first ones, even though, you know, that may not be the case. And so I wish I had a better answer for you there because look, everybody wants to feel special, right? And I think it's just fair to say, maybe guys have less control in this area where if we're offering sex, so let's let's just talk about this. If we're offering sex up front, they, they may take it, right? But I argued back with him to say, if they take it, it shows their their standards, right? So if somebody stands on a higher moral ground, like, well, you shouldn't have sex, but they're also willing to, I feel like that that's, you know, that's not fair, And I think this is the typical argument, right? This is what we've, this is the conversation we've been having for years. The girl's a slut, the guy's a stud. And it's like, we're, we're so sick of hearing that because why can't the girl get be caught up in the moment? And why does it have to mean, okay, I guess I'm a slut. So now you don't want to have a relationship with me. Now I'm not worthy of getting to know. 
I have heard this argument over and over again, and I think there are valid points. I think that guys really do think that. I think they can have a double standard and that sucks. However, I want you to think of it in a little bit different way. I wrote this on Instagram and as I was writing it, I thought, God, I can't leave people hanging here. This, this, this needs more context around it. So I said, okay, when, we, when should I have sex? How soon is too soon? So I said, let's take morals and values out of it for a second. And as weird as that sounds, just hear me out. The number one complaint we have about men is that they ghost or disappear. So when it happens early and he leaves, we think, oh, he just wanted to get laid. Or we think, oh, I must be bad in bed or he wasn't attracted to me. So we make ourselves feel like all I was good for was sex or if if the sex was good, that's all he wanted and or he didn't like sex and he wasn't into me. He didn't like he didn't like the experience. OK, I feel like this experience we have turned into he doesn't like me. I'm not worthy, but I want you to think of it this way. When, when we actually do have sex early, we have, before we make the decision, we think, if I don't, he'll leave. So I risk, you feel like there's a risk either way. So you're like, if I don't, he might lose interest. And then what if he is only in it for the sex? So there's this fear of, I don't want to be the girl that is a prude, but I, you don't want to be a prude and you don't want to be a slut right? So you're like, which, what do I do? Because if you really like the guy and you're caught up in the moment and then he pulls away or he ghosts or he disappears, then how do you deal with that? So I'm going to, let's, let's pause on that decision for a second. Actually, I'm never going to try to make that decision for you. I just want to give you a different perspective here. So whether people admit it or not, when we are dating and we're out I don't think people are out and about. I know there are some, but I really believe in in everyone's heart that no one's like, hey, I'm looking around this place for a really good orgasm. I wonder who will give me the best orgasm. I believe that people are looking for intimacy, which intimacy really only comes when you actually know someone and you're close to them and you actually have a friendship foundation where there's like, I know you, we've built a connection over time. But if we have sex right away, we usually can only do that with someone that we have that chemistry and that passion. It's like, oh, you hit it off. And it's like all the sparks are flying. And there's an illusion created in that moment, that evening, that there is that sense of intimacy and closeness. And we get to have that for a night. And that is a high. However, and I'm not, that's not even the point of the story, but it's, We're building to the crescendo here, but that's part of it. But when it's over, when you're laying there naked in bed and the act is done, now what? That now what part after sex has happened is is a lot more pressure to do what? What do you think it is? I want you to think about, okay, what is the pressure on the guy? Some of you might be thinking, oh, there's pressure to like, oh, perform again or beat that performance, or how does he top that experience? What does he do next? And it might seem really obvious, like, well, why can't we just go out again? Why can't we just continue to have a good time? Even if you are just out there to have sex, but guess what starts to happen? As soon as you connect in that way, you can't help but be seen. And what I mean by be seen is seen for who you are, what you like, what you don't like, your lifestyle, your job, because now come the questions. Now comes getting to know you, you know, like the getting to know you phase. Some people cannot deal with that piece, men and women. It's like, oh man, I really like this person, but now they're going to want to get to know me. And let me tell you, I've coached thousands of women and anytime there's a ghosting and a like a disappearing, reappearing dude. The reason he's disappearing is never, I have never coached someone where they're like, yeah, he was disappearing because he didn't like the sex or he wasn't attracted to me. That was never the reason. The reason was always something to do with, I don't have enough money, I don't have a good enough job, or he didn't feel good in his own body, or he has erectile dysfunction, or he has 
a, a drinking problem or a drug problem. There is something else that he sits with and says, this was fun, but in order to take it to the next step, she has to see me. Seeing him naked wasn't it like people can have sex and feel close and it's hot and it's fun and sex is like the most personal thing we can do without getting personal. It's it's the physical act we can get caught up in just the lust. So if we do not have a foundation built, it's strictly a lust type of deal. And I think this is a lot of times why people they build a relationship with all this lust, but then they don't really have anything else going on that's in that foundation, friendship, getting along, getting to know each other. Do you even like this person? You might be really attracted to them, but do you like them? Do you enjoy them? And that is a risk that people are terrified to take. Oh God, what if she gets to know me and she doesn't like me? Then what do I do? And that becomes the scary part. And the reason I believe most one night stands happen. Yes, I think people wake up next to the person and they're like, I had beer goggles on. You know, it does happen. So is it possible they're not attracted to you? Yes. I mean, any, I don't care if you're a supermodel. There are guys that look at some supermodels and be like, oh, I think she's ugly. You know, I mean, sometimes you look at, I've looked at supermodels and thought she's kind of plain looking. And then other one, like some people think Giselle is not attractive. I think she's beautiful. I follow her on Instagram. She's like my you know, workout inspiration. So, but some people look at her and go, eh, that is possible. And and it's also the risk we take. It's like, oh yeah, I don't know. It's just how drunk is this person that I'm going to have sex with? So you have to think of that too. How soon is too soon? Well, how drunk are they? You know, like, do they really know who they're having sex with? I mean, this is the, this is the world we're in, right? And the reason I say take morals and values out of the picture is because, we all have different perspectives there. And so I'm not going to tell you how to live your life based on my moral standards or the moral standards of some other expert. You're going to make those decisions. But regardless of what religion, faith, belief system we have, what we all share in common is we don't want to be rejected. We don't want to feel like, oh, he didn't really like me. And so now I have to live with this feeling, this yucky feeling. And I can tell you there were many times that I chose to wait. I was more conservative from the sex standpoint. And many times I make guys wait. And let me tell you, gumball guys will wait to have sex. They will wait a long time. So don't think that the guy who waits for sex is magically a great guy. But I would see a lot of guys not be able to deal with the rejection of waiting. They were, they would take that as I I can't deal with the fact that that's not available to me. So let's look at it from this perspective. When you eliminate sex as an option, and they do stick around, you're going to see not only if they want to get to know you, but if they are able to even do that. Can they build intimacy? Can they have a conversation? Are they ready to share themselves and their lives? Are you never seeing their apartment? Do you not know really what they do for a living? Is he kind of a mystery? I mean, there's so many guys that are pulling this game where it's like, well, we never go to his apartment and I don't even know what he drives or I don't know where he works exactly or he's kind of vague or I don't know. Like you think maybe there's an ex-wife or there is a wife or there is a girlfriend or it's everything. If everything's always happening at your place or there are huge things about his life that you really don't know, then he's probably hiding something major. Therefore, he's not ready for a relationship. I can tell you, and I'll, Ian and I will tell our story later, but when we first met, we reconnected five years later. That, But the time we connected the first time, he was not ready for a relationship. And I thought there was something wrong with me. And he was going through something major on his side that I didn't know of until years later. I had a kind of an idea, but I didn't know. So I made up all kinds of stories in my head that were not real but I didn't have any information and my own insecurity haunted me during that time. So I want you to just keep that in mind that we're usually never being rejected for the reasons we think we are, that you probably are attractive to him. He he probably does want to see you again. 
but he can't deal with you seeing him. Ooh, he wants to see you, but he can't deal with you seeing him. I should, I should Instagram that, <laughs> but you know what I mean? And we don't, and then we're like, yeah, I get it, but I still want to see him. And I know, I get it. But I also, every time I, every time I didn't have sex with a guy and I would wait it out and then he would disappear or he would stop texting or calling or he wouldn't ask me out again, it did not feel good. But I can look back and I'm never thinking, man, I wish I would have had sex with all those guys that ended up not having what it took to get to know me. I'm glad I tested them enough to, okay, great, we're having a good time. So let's see if you want to sit over how many dinners and lunches and breakfasts and whatever and get to know me before we are physical together. And if they can't do that part, let me tell you, just being on the other side going on two years in a long-term committed relationship, although, you know, almost a year and a half, almost two years, I don't, I don't think that's a really long time by, you know, most couples that have been in a long relationship. It's multiple, but I'm saying like we're, our intention, right, is to be in a long-term committed relationship. And we're very committed to each other. And I see the devotion it takes, the constant thinking of the other person, the collaboration, the team effort. I just, I'm in awe of it every day that I'm a very generous person and I'm always thinking of other people, but to have a partner that's also doing that, that's thinking about if my water is full, my lemon water is refreshed and making sure I'm hydrated. It's just like one of the things he's always doing for me because he can see when I'm not taking care of myself or I'm getting too busy or when I was making my schedule for how many coaching clients can I really take on? And he was like pushing back on me. I was creating these different programs, which I'll be telling you about. And he's like, I just don't think that's the right move for you. And I I could feel myself resisting him, but then I could also sense he's right. I'm. This is where I'm pushing myself beyond what I need to. And just having someone be conscientious enough and caring enough and in tune with you to know these things, it takes a certain level of self-awareness, awareness of others to care. And I remember my own therapist telling me, look at their relationships. How many relationships do they manage and how long have they been managing those relationships? And so as I got to know him, there are all these people in his life that he texts and that he calls and keeps in regular touch with dudes he's gone to high school with, college with, but a lot of them, most of them are long-term. People he's known for a really, you know, and relationships he's nurtured over time. So when you think about it, when we have relationships we nurture over time, we're, we're reaching out, how are you doing, what's going on? It's a genuine interest in other people. And so if this guy that you wanna hook up with doesn't have that capacity, he doesn't have that level of depth, then you you run the risk of that rejection. And I know sometimes it it seems like we live in this world where everyone's pretending that being this sexual person is so glamorous. It's not. I mean, how many super glamorous sexual experiences have you really had? I mean, be honest. How many times has some guy just knocked your socks off? You know, usually it's it's not as glamorous as people are trying to make it into being. And I remember talking to my number one gumball guy, and he was he was very young when we dated, but then he developed a very player lifestyle. We would connect as friends every once in a while after we finally broke off our, we got, got back together three times. And I connected with him years later and I asked him, you know, he would, he would kind of brag about his lifestyle. And I'd say, I said to him like, you know, how good is the sex really when it's just somebody you don't even know. And he goes, it's actually not that great. I'm like, right? I'm like, I I was proud of him for even admitting it. And I said, so who do you think the best sex is with? And he goes, somebody I care about. Like, exactly. So we're glamorizing something because I think we're trying so hard to just feel close to someone. We want, we want the affection. We want the kisses, the, the hugs, the touch. And that leads to sex. I, I really feel, feel like most people would would be perfectly fine with a hot makeout and some some touching. And if they knew that that's where, you know, it could just end at that and they could just get that. That's the fix I think people are looking for because we really are starving for the real thing. 
We want the real thing. Who doesn't? It's naturally in us. We are built to love. That is what makes us different than a lot of the animals, although I think so many animals love. So, but you know, I mean, when you look at the animal kingdom, it's not as complicated as our as our love, as our relationships, the care, the details, all all the things. So when we're trying to justify the one night stands, the hookups, be honest with yourself. What am I actually looking for? And if I do it with this guy, am I risking feeling rejected? And then sitting there trying to analyze all of the reasons he's not calling back. And never in my life did I think he's not calling me back because he's not ready to be seen. He's not ready to be vulnerable. And this is where people would say he's emotionally unavailable. And that's exactly right. They are emotionally unavailable. They're not ready to, for lack of better terms, expose themselves. They are ready to expose themselves, but not in the emotional way. So it's a cheap thrill. It becomes a cheap thrill. It becomes the easy way to get what they want without making the investment. I can have the benefit. That's what they call it, friends with benefits, which friends with benefits, people have asked me this a lot. And I always say, you know, when they're like, what do you think about friends with benefits? And I say, I think somebody is always in love and not admitting it. And the other person is avoiding. So the person in love is the one that's abandoning their own needs to be with that person. And there's this hope that it will turn into something. I just don't think very many people are hooking up for the sake of hooking up. And they're really not getting emotionally attached because your brain releases those attachment and bonding chemicals, regardless of how intellectual you think you're being about it. And I just think people might be able to argue in a, in a debate, but when, they lay, when you lay down on, when all of us, when we lay down at night, our head hits the pillow and there's that moment we have by ourselves or the moment in the morning when you wake up and if you ever sit with yourself, which a lot of people don't do, met, we we're medicating, we're numbing, And a lot of times the sex, the one night stands, the player develops this lifestyle because it numbs him from having to feel what he really feels to even look at himself. So a lot of times when people don't want you to look at them, it's because they don't want to look at themselves either. So this whole thing that they're doing, this one night stand, you're just part of the drug, you're part of the numbing process. And they're really good at that beginning part. They're really good at seducing you. I was just listening to... Robert Green on the Skinny Confidential podcast. And oh my gosh, it was so good. And they were talking about all the different ways of seduction. I'm going to get this book because I loved how he had five or six different types of seduction. And one of them he talked about was, I think he called it the rake. And I don't think it's like R-A-K-E. I have to look it up. Anyway, he was talking about a certain type of guy that really, he goes, this type of guy loves women and loves everything about them and is kind of obsessive about them, but he's never happy with just one. And so, but he really understands women. And so he's able to get into their minds and, and know how they, how, what they want, how they want to be pleased. But he said, they're not really interested in the world they live in. What's, what's happening in your day to day that they have no interest. So they have this appetite of, I love women. And I was listening to this and I was thinking, that means he doesn't actually love women. He loves what women can give him. He likes the high of figuring her out and watching her fall for him, but he's not actually falling for her. He's not actually interested in what she's doing and who she is and what makes her tick and all the things that make up her life. This is what you are absolutely entitled to expect is someone who is interested in your world, your your friends, your work, your pets, your choice of nail color, hair color, makeup, whatever. I can talk to I can talk to him about anything and he will sit there and, you know, for some things, you know, there's a limit. He's 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 a guy's guy, so you know, he's not gonna go in depth about the different t- types of highlights for too long, but he will talk about it for, you know, enough where, you know, otherwise I feel like, okay, I'm going to let you <laughs> off the hook. But I'm just saying like, I can have that conversation. And if it's important to me, he's totally available to discuss it. And I don't feel like 
um, have to perform or do anything special to keep him interested, like oh, just the exhaustion of the gumball guy. But the seductive guy will create the illusion he's interested in those things. But then after sex happens, you see that shift, that energy where it pivots and then you get that sick feeling in your gut like, okay, this now this doesn't feel good. The guy that's really into you, you will always feel good. You will always feel protected, cared for, and I want to say nurtured. That's the word I was looking for. So to wrap this up, I, w- I hope this helps you think of the one night stand a little bit differently. That when you're caught up in the moment, you can ask yourself, you know, maybe you're at the bar and you're thinking about going to his place or yours. Go to the ladies room and stand there and look in the mirror and be like, okay, am I am I looking for a gumball right now? Am I looking for the quick hit? Do I want to see if this could go somewhere with this guy? Let's see if he has relationship material. Let's see if he has those qualities. Let's see if this is worth, because if he's worth it, it's also worth waiting. Allow yourselves to get to know each other because really prolonging it would probably make the sex better anyway because you're going to know each other so much better. You'll be so much more comfortable. So just again, when you take morals and values out of it and you're not, nobody's talking down and you just look at it like, okay, is this the best time? If I put sex out there, then then you've already you've already been naked, you've already had sex, you've already done the you've already pushed it to the max, right? So it it makes it so that you feel like you have to be advanced in the way you're communicating. It's like, well, you've already had sex, so it feels like it's further along than it is. And so that expectation of where it needs to go next, it's like there's there's pressure there. So not only she wants to, so look, let's think of the guy who's not ready. Oh my gosh, we've had sex. And now what does she expect? Because I feel like now, does she expect me to be exclusive? Does she expect a relationship? Does she expect me to take her out? And, you know, like, uh, whatever holiday is coming up, like, if he's not ready, like now, if he's not ready, that's going to freak him out. And that's where you get the skittish behavior. And then there's all this dating advice that says, okay, now, don't call him you know, don't do this. And if he's, if he's acting a certain type of way after you have sex, then here are the three things you can do to reel him back in. No, if he's doing those things, that's your signal. Okay, this guy's emotionally unavailable, not ready for a relationship, not ready to be seen. And anything I do cannot be some kind of strategy to reel him back in. You, there's no reeling. You need to be coming together equally willingly, openly, there is no, I'm doing something to make him do something. That's manipulation. So when you're reading advice, ask yourself, is this manipulating him? And then if you're playing the game, I'm going to wait for him to call. Like, okay, I mean, then what? So then he calls, but is he calling three days later, four days later? And then you're like, does he just want to hook up again? No, you need a guy that's like, Okay, l- let's say let's say you had a one night stand or not a one night stand. Let's say if you had sex on the first night or the second night. There are guys that can have a relationship after that. It's rare. So all I'm saying is it's a massive risk to do it because if you really like the guy and you want to see if there's relationship potential and you don't want to feel rejected because he's afraid to move forward after sex, he's afraid of the pressure then like I talked to you before, I do feel like it's a double standard to make it seem like, oh, I guess she does this with every guy. So I'm not interested in her. Maybe that crosses his mind. However, if he is ready, if he is open for a relationship, it does happen where he's like, oh, I know I had sex with her, but I do want to see her again. I do. I do. But that decision of I do want to see her again. I am interested in getting to know her. She was so much fun only can come from a place of I'm ready for a relationship. I don't care if she sees me. I feel good in my job. I feel good in my body. I don't have an addiction issue. I'm not hiding anything. She can see my apartment and I'm proud of my life and I have great friends. I mean, people that have a stable life are and they are ready, then that's when people can get caught up in that and and, and it sometimes can work. But if you look at it from that perspective, 
and you're standing there in the bathroom like, okay, I know that we could go home together and we could have sex, but if he's not ready for a relationship, then this may be the last time you see him. Is it worth it? Or give it a few more dates. See if he's even willing to go on date two or three. And if he is, then it's up to you to decide how long. I'm just going to tell you to wait as long as possible because I've seen gumball guys, even when I've made them wait, they've kept up the facade for a long period of time. And I realized then it was never about the sex. Because I didn't ha- I didn't give sex up very often early on, that or hardly at all, I still saw the gumball guy cycle. And it was... A a lot of times it was about the attention. Like I can tell you the one, sometimes the gumball guy is not a player. He's not an arouse me kind of guy where sex is not his gumball. So if sex, not his gumball, it's entertaining him. It's idolizing him. It's chasing him. It's making him feel like if you make him feel like a really important guy and you're really falling for him, giving him googly eyes, he's, he can be completely satisfied with that and, and not be getting sex but still be a gumball guy. The longer, however, the longer you wait, now that you have me and we gumball love is some, this was back when I was like, way before I even knew about gumball love. I wasn't thinking about it then before I came up with this concept. I would just think, wow, I even didn't give him sex and he still stuck around, but then he turned into a jerk still. Like I would still see the cycle repeat, but I didn't understand what was going on. So, I'm telling you that he will stick around for the attention, but he still may not be ready for a relationship, even when you withhold sex. So I, I just want to say that because it, there is this idea out there that if, if I withhold sex, then I'm going to find out he's a really good guy. Now we still need to be looking for the other signs, but the other signs will be so much easier for you to hear and to see if you are aware of them. So I just coached somebody who said, I've only listened to one podcast. Coach, she'd never heard of, she didn't even know what gumball love was. So she just like listened to one podcast. She was like, I want to do a coaching session. So I highly recommend you go and you listen to some of those other episodes that explain the different gumballs, explain the different types. And I'm going to make this so much easier for you very soon. We're creating a quiz where you'll be able to spend, I I wanted the quiz to take like three to five minutes and because who wants to take like a 30 minute quiz? No one. But I'm, we're working on it. We're finding the the developers. So you can just take a quiz and go, what is who? What is this guy doing? Like what's happening? I don't get it. And it will help you understand gumball love so much better. But the, the bottom line is, is he seeking attention or connection? Does he want the quick hit of the gumball? Or does he, is he looking for the long term getting to know, is getting to know you the exciting part and connecting and enjoying each other. That should be the high of a relationship, the enjoyment of each other and laughing together and the common things, things you have in common and sharing your morals, beliefs, all of those things. So to speak about the morals, if you have high morals and you're going against them because you feel pressure that the guy is going to not be interested in you, he's not a match anyway. We need to be with people that match our morals and standards. So if you have high morals and standards and you conduct yourself in a certain way, that's going to attract the guy that also conducts himself in a certain way. And you're going to have, he's going to respect you so much. So do what you want to do. And everybody is going to get caught up in that temptation of lust. Everybody's going to feel that with somebody and it, the decision is never easy. So I wanted to make this podcast so that you can if you have had sex with a guy too soon and you're sitting there wondering how did that night was so amazing, what happened? I want you to think of a guy that's probably really down. He could be very depressed and he may not look depressed at all. He could have a major addiction problem. He could have been married. He could have been in a relationship. He could be gay and not not out yet. I've dated guys that that's happened to where I was like, I remember going on dates with this guy in New York and he was like, uh, what's wrong? I go, oh, I've never had a guy touch me less. Like it was like, this guy is not into women, but he kept pursuing me because he was actually his sister was gay 
And his family was completely okay with it. But for some reason, he didn't want to admit it to himself. So he kept trying to date me. And it was like, this is not, this is not it. And I felt super rejected because he wasn't pursuing me like a heterosexual guy would, right? So I was feeling like, hey, you know, this is not what I typically get from a heterosexual man. And I wasn't really saying these things to him. I was just sensing because I even asked him, are you sure that you're not gay? And he was like, yes, I'm sure. But it was like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think you're sure. I think that you are gay and you just haven't admitted it to yourself. And later he was able to, but that's, it was way after we, we dated, but it just, some, I'm just saying, you just never know where someone is and you can feel super rejected, but you are not the issue. It's a lot of times it's something else. And then let's just say the worst case scenario is they aren't attracted or it wasn't a connection for them. You don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to be with that. Who wants to be with somebody who's not attracted to them? Do you want somebody to be with, like, can you, I always tell the girls, like, if they're not into their guy, like, well, would you want him to stay with you if he wasn't into you? And they're like, oh God, no, you don't want anybody forcing themselves. Like, look, sometimes it's just, I remember going out with this guy a long time ago. I don't even know, like probably 20 years ago. And he was just a good looking guy, built really well. I felt nothing for him. He felt nothing for me. It was like a business lunch. It was like, yeah, nice to meet you. I think we even shook hands. It was just like, I will never see you again. I will never see you again. That's probably what we were both thinking. But it was just like a big fat zero on that date. And so, and I could look at him and go, he's he's actually a hot guy. But for me, it just, I felt nothing. And so sometimes that can happen. And again, do we want to have sex with somebody? That, that could happen too. Or it's like, oh, I was feeling it that night, but. Not so much tonight. So it's all in the level of rejection you can handle. But I want you to go into it with a different mindset. And if you are not pursued after, to not immediately jump to those conclusions. And really consider that people disappear and ghost. Let me just tell you one thing. If he disappears on you after sex and then randomly appears again, you can be assured it was not physical attraction because they they like you, they have fun, they miss it, they think about it. And that's the stuff that gets in your head. Like, oh, you're thinking about me. You want, Sure, he's thinking about you. Sure, he wants to be with you, but he can't do it. He doesn't have the capacity. He's not ready. He's not able. So we keep trying to be with somebody who really can't be in a relationship, who hides every time they feel a little bit seen. That's what the disappearing is. Let's, let's stop. Let's stop talking about ghosting. It's hiding. Well, you're hiding now because you don't want to come out to play. You know, like I don't have time for that. And I did get to a point where I just I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm building my business. I got back to myself. I danced. I created the Back to You Academy. I pulled myself out of online dating, and then I just. Start, I started praying, started praying for my future husband. I started praying that I would make the right decisions. Then I got completely turned off by online dating. And I was like, then I started feeling his energy. I started feeling somebody that was about to come into my life. I did a podcast about it. So it's documented. And I was like, I know I sound crazy. And then in January of 2020 was when he came into my life. So, but does that mean that I've reached success just because I have a relationship in my life? No, the success was when I became happy with my life and I continued to build on that and I kept curating and cultivating my own life and my own relationships until I got to a point where I thought, you know, I don't want to do this one in, alone anymore. I'm, I'm very content and I don't, the person I want is very specific and if I meet him, great, but I did get to a point where I admitted to myself, okay, I do want somebody. And I I just told him the other day, I said, I thought about stuff like, I don't want to carry everything. I don't want to carry all the groceries. I don't want to manage two dogs by myself. It was just like, it was like the the mundane day-to-day -day stuff that I would think about. And then it was some of the, it was the major stuff. I want somebody to talk to and talk about ideas and talk about all the weird stuff I want to talk about, like conspiracy theories that really are they conspiracy theories or are they just people thinking outside of 
what mainstream media says. Mainstream media tells us one thing, and then politicians tell us something different or the same thing, or pharmaceutical companies, and then what are they saying about aliens? And what, like, like think about all these things. Like, I want to know, and I would talk, I would try to talk about it with certain guys, and they would just be like, you think too much, or I don't like to talk about that, or I can't handle that. And then I would think, oh, I'm such a weirdo. Like, I can't. And then I would say, mostly well, you cannot talk about this stuff with guys on dates because it's like, you know, you got to just focus on the people you can talk about it with, but don't expect this to be something you could talk about with your significant other. And so I would just try to push it down. And now, I mean, that was actually one of the things that Ian and I bonded on was all the weird things. He wanted to talk about them too. There's nothing too weird. We've talked about it all all the time. And any th- anytime, you know, I realize I don't really need to be talking about it all the time, but things come up that make me question. And then have you ever gone down a weird rabbit hole on YouTube and you're like, wow, like if you go down like the flat earth rabbit hole and you just listen to these videos and then you just want to be able to ta- have a ridiculous conversation and maybe challenge what you've been taught your whole life. Like, I don't know, I'm just using this as an example that I thought that was too weird. I thought that nobody would accept me for that or even engage in that kind of discussion. And it turns out the love of my life will engage in that and and not only will, but sees that as the number one plus. The weirdest things I thought about me, the most intimidating things, like how about doing this? I thought I would never find a guy that could handle gumball love. How do you handle a girl that's talking about relationships and crappy dudes all the time? He writes content for me. Like, he'll be like, hey, you th- think about this. If you thought about the chase me guy, I don't think I'd like, like, I literally text him. I was like, which gumball guy lectures women? And he responded, I'm getting my nails done. I'm like, which flavor, which flavor of attention needs to lecture? What's the lecturing thing about? And he was like, oh, I think almost every Every flavor could be a lecturer, but for sure the convince me skeptic guy is the guy that's the, the guy that lectures. And so um, anyway, that's a whole other topic. I want to leave you on this. Just I want you to let go of the guilt. If you had a one night stand or you've had 51 night stands where however you're feeling, if you're feeling guilty, you're feeling like, man, was I slutty? Nobody took an interest in me. I guarantee you if you got in a habit of having a lot of sex with guys and hooking up a lot, the hookup culture is probably loaded, not probably, the hookup culture is loaded with people that aren't ready for a relationship. They think they are, they want to be, but they're really not. So it's numbing. So don't take it as personal as you might. Don't, Don't let yourself get down in the dumps. I really want you to approach it with a little bit more empathy and go, okay, if somebody did that, they, they did not do it with the intention of hurting me or rejecting me. Chances are they're rejecting themselves. So, and also, can't you kind of relate a little bit? Like if, if you do have the, if you do have sex early on, it is a little bit scary to see them again because it's like, okay, I don't really know you. I'm not really comfortable with you. And so now I've, you've already seen me naked and now I feel like kind of, you know, queasy about it. You know, like that, it is, it is gutsy to show up again when they've already seen you naked. So it takes some guts. If they don't have it, they're not going to show up. Or they need to wait a while, like days or weeks, and then they come back and you're like, is this the rando from whatever club? Like, what is he doing? And then you stare at the phone and you're like, oh, this is interesting. And you're like, look who's texting. He's texting because he had enough time to not be scared. Okay, I know. It's like, who tells who talks about it this way other than me? I wish I knew. But I just feel like this is what's going on. And most of the time when I've asked other guys, they just stare at you like, I don't want that to be the reason. I want to be the cool player. It's got so many ladies and I'm, I've got so many choices to make. BS. I don't think so. Prove me wrong. I would love it. Send me an email that says like, guys are players to numb and they're not ready to be emotionally available. And they want to call you back. But They can't because they're scared. Prove me wrong. I'm sitting here at my table ready for you to like Lucy on peanuts. (laughs) Anyway, so I'm going to leave you there. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to do a one-on-one coaching, I would love to meet you in person, chat about your, your situation. 
that I've been overusing that word, but everyone's in a situation. What is your situation? Where are you? How can I help you? The bigger the mess, I love. Like I, ha- I just coached someone who's in a really complicated situation and she was so, she felt all of these different things and I was just like, oh, I love helping someone figure out a mess, like something that's very difficult if you are, whatever, if you, whatever situation you're in, I'm, the more challenging, the more complicated, the more messy, the more I'm excited to work with you and help you get through it. So I know people say there's no judgment, but for me, really, like that's, if I was judgmental, it would be so boring and not interesting. Let's, let's, whatever it is, let's just show up and figure it out and do it together. My biggest fear is that you're doing it alone. So click the link in my Instagram bio, go to my website, gumballlove.com. I would love to meet you in person. All right, girls, until next time, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you want more information or to schedule a private coaching session or better yet to join the next Back to You Academy, go to gumballlove.com. If you loved this podcast, I would love for you to share it with your friends. And if you really loved it, a five-star review is the best compliment you can give. Remember, you are enough. You are right where you should be. And the only thing you have to do is keep going. I'll leave you with my favorite quote by Henry David Thoreau. Go confidently in the direction of your dreams and live the life you have imagined. Until next time, I'll see you soon.